Hi, welcome to Ladies of Another View on Beck. And today, the weather is being talked about, but so is energy, because when you've got extreme weather, you need energy. So we have Julie Fedorchek with us. She's a um, public service commissioner in Bismarck. And we have Carmen and Jan to join the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'll just tell you right now, we have a little unusual schedule today, because we're going to have um, a conversation, and then we're going to go to the break. And that conversation will continue online at Beck. Dot news dot com because there's going to be a class A W D A semifinal boys hockey Williston against Bismarck Century. So um, if you don't care about hockey, you can continue this conversation <laughs> online. But but let's get started because um, Julie's in big demand right now. I really appreciate <laughs> you coming to the show. Very My much. pleasure to talk about Thanks, energy. Um, where to begin? Texas is in the news, and what's going on in Texas has affected North Dakota too, right? Well, to some extent, um, for sure. Mostly, from my pers perspective, we look at Texas and say, okay, we need to learn lessons from this and make sure that the mistakes that are being made down there aren't being duplicated in our area. So Texas is, one of the challenges for Texas is they're kind of an island when it comes to electricity. They've created their own market, and they only have two sort of small ties to the other bigger markets that serve North Dakota, and um, serve all the way from Texas up to North Dakota. And, uh, and so they've created this island, so when they, in times of trouble, like now, they don't have a lot of other places to draw on for extra power. So um, that's one of their challenges. The other big challenge that they have is they're an unregulated market. And, uh, and so what that means is the companies just build there and compete in the market. They sell their power into the market. And nobody is looking at what, um, how much they might need to meet the demand that is project projected and planned for. In North Dakota and most of the other states in the Midwest, they're called integrated systems where you are re they're regulated by people like myself and others like me in other states and the companies are monopolies, like in Bismarck, you have MDU, you don't get to pick somebody else. In Texas, you can pick. You can pick and choose from electric pro providers. And so, um, so it's very different there. Uh, we have the regulated market where the utilities or the co-ops have their territories where they serve, and they get all those customers in those territories. And then they, the co-ops work with their boards of directors. The investor-owned utilities, like MDU, uh, work with us and they say, here's our projections for our demand, here's how we plan to meet them, here's how much money we need. And in that conversation, we talk about resource mix, we talk about um, how many renewables, how many uh, traditional facilities that can be dispatched when you need them, and how much, uh, how, how much is it gonna cost to do whichever combination we choose. And, and we have those discussions in, in um, and so they're regulated in that way. Texas doesn't have that. It's an open market. So it's more challenging because oh, you have yeah. to have the right market signals telling companies to come there and build. And they obviously weren't prepared for this weather extreme and didn't have enough resources, just in a simple, very simple supply and demand. There was way more demand than supply. And the way the electric grid works, it always has to be in balance every minute. The electricity on the grid has to equal the demand on the grid. And so these uh, engineers that operate the grid, they have to um, be constantly monitoring that and turning up generation, turning down generation. Um, that's why <clears throat> if you get into the renewables, which are um, just available when they're available, but if there's a cloud that comes by on a solar facility, that thing basically shuts off. Now that doesn't go on the grid. And so they have to back it up with something else that has to be met, ready, you know, just like that. So it's challenging. Uh, it's a really complicated um, system. The, the electric grid is considered one of the most complicated machines ever created by man. And we've made it more complicated by introducing the renewables, which are intermittent and aren't there at a steady pace, like all the previous facilities, coal, nuclear, uh, even combined cycle natural gas, have traditionally been. You turn them on and they stay there. So that's some of the Very challenges. Very interesting, and I've never mm -hmm. heard it explained that way. Very interesting, because you would think, I guess it's the Wild West in Texas, you know, yeah. whatever. <laughs> and, and I know I've, I've, I've visited there before. They kind of are, you know, do your own thing. But it didn't work very well for them. 
this this go around with the with the intense weather, the cold, cold weather they weren't expecting. Um, so you would think that it's more competitive, but it's less regulated, and so because we're regulated, that's a good thing, right? I think it is a good thing, especially in a place like North Dakota where there's not enough customers here to trigger a lot of competition, and it's the reason why most utilities were regulated um, from from the get-go was because the investments are so large in terms of infrastructure that it costs a lot to recover those investments and so it really wasn't the type of an industry that lent itself to a lot of competition because the initial investment was so big and so early on way back in the you know when electricity was first invented and you started having municipal power uh, systems they became uh, it was obvious even to the early folks that we needed to have um, just one big investment in this infrastructure and then spread it over a customer base and then um, and that it wouldn't be a really um, lend itself a lot to, to com competitors coming in. So in order to have a natural, it's called a natural monopoly because it is naturally something that you isn't lending itself to competition. So then you have to create competition and like regulators like myself, we're that competition. We're, we substitute for the competition and make sure that uh, they don't just get to charge whatever they want. So with renewable energy requirements that, you know, all of these utility companies have and our state has, this situation of rolling blackouts, brownouts, that kind of thing, that's likely to continue, is it not? With well, the push for it? I sure hope not. I, I sure hope not, Jan, because that's really um, the the goal of the utilities and the, the mission of the utilities. They're obligated to provide safe, reliable, cost-effective utility service. That's what customers pay for. And so um, it's it's gotten more difficult with the advent of renewables because it's a it's a question mark that kind of gets thrown into the system. And so there are hundreds of and thousands of really smart science scientists and engineers who are, real, are focused on this very problem every single day trying to figure out how to make this work better you know how to decrease the variables and increase you know improve weather forecasts they've done those have um, improved by leaps and bounds just in my eight years on the commission so they can have better forecasts for what is going to be available to predict what they're going to need to back it up and then there's new technologies that have been invented to help um, the ramping of the other resources, the more traditional resources, to come on quicker to back things up. Um, so the, the prediction is really important so you can have make sure you have enough resources available. Uh, the weather predictions are, are really important. And then the flexibility of the fleet. So um, I hope that we don't continue to see these uh, blackouts, brownouts, but it is one of the risks with introducing the variables into the grid. And it's important for, for people to understand that. You know, yes. if I could continue on this line, I, I feel like one of, the, um, one of the issues that hasn't gotten a lot of attention in the whole discussion about renewables, I feel like customers have kind of been told like, oh, these renewables are just great, you know, and why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we pick renewables? Because they're renewable <laughs> and they're clean. <laughs> And it makes sense. I mean, I even agree, like, yes, renewables are something I'm excited about, but there's a, there's a downside too, and, the, and you have to be realistic about them and what the shortcomings are. And the shortcoming is you cannot dispatch it. That's what they call when they put it, when they um, turn something on, that's called dispatching the electricity. You can't dispatch it. You can use it when it's available, and when it's not available, you need something else to, to, be, to be available. So really, from customer standpoint, you have to invest in both. Previously, you just paid for the traditional fleet, and that was it, and that provided power all the time. Now you're paying for some of the traditional fleet, maybe a little bit less, but not that much less, because like in, in the MISO territory, which covers all of the investor-owned utilities in North Dakota, 95% of the fuel source over the course of the last couple of weeks was the traditionals. The renewables only provided just a tiny sliver of the of the power need. So we, but we've invested. You look around the Midwest. There's a lot of wind farms. There's a lot of solar farms. So customers, customers are paying for that. It isn't the utility investors that are paying for that. Ah. That is customers, 100 percent. 
That's interesting. And, and uh, so customers are paying for that, and you're paying for the stuff that needs to be available to back it up. So you're paying for both. The goal long term is to be able to replace, have fewer of the dispatchable, and then the long term goal is to have storage. And I think that's what everybody is investing in and looking toward is once we get storage where you can take the renewables when they're available, store them all up, and then have them to dispatch later, then they become a lot more cost effective. And, and the whole concept makes more sense then. But we're not there yet. So as far as the renewables go and the traditional, the coal, the natural gas, all that, mm -hmm. is there a federal policy, or I don't know what word to use, for how much renewable source has to be in the power grid at, at any given time, or is there a certain you know, amount of gigawatts or whatever per year that need to come from renewables? Is there some sort of rule or, on that, or law, or anything like that? There isn't. No, okay. there's no renew nationwide renewable policy standard. Those are set by the states currently. Now, that could change. I mean, President Biden could uh, work with Congress, the Democrat Congress, and they could they could do any number of things. They could create a carbon tax that would uh, be an additional cost put on anything that emits carbon. Any carbon emission would carry with it a cost. Those two would be covered by customers. That would just be added right into the rate. So you'd be that would be passed along to customers. They could require you know a, have a renewable. Pol uh, Okay, I'm going to stop too. right here. So any number of things. We're going to stop here because we got to stop for a commercial break. And this <laughs> continue. We, we have WDA Boys High School Hockey coming up, but you can watch the rest of this conversation on Beck.News.com. And we'll be right back after these messages with Ladies of Another View on Beck. Jeez, what a mess. Look at that, there's roof stuff everywhere. It's so embarrassing, ruins the neighborhood. Come on humans, let's get this fixed. Don't let your roof go to the dogs. Call America's best contractors for your free estimate. Need a new woof? After checking with the rest, go with the best. America's best contractors, 258-2412. Online at americasbestcontractorsincorporated.com. Beck Communications is hiring. Beck Communications is seeking qualified candidates for plant technicians in our Wheatland, North Dakota location. Beck Communications is an equal opportunity employer. To view the job details, visit www.beck.coop. To apply, email your cover letter and resume to careers at bechtel.coop. Beck Communications, making connections that matter. In southwestern and south central North Dakota on any given day at any given moment, a Dakota Community Bank and Trust customer is logging in or signing on to do their online or mobile banking. We believe that community banking can blend both the past with down-home customer service in-house and the future with modern banking conveniences and technology for our customers anywhere, like here or here, all while honoring our long-standing tradition of community-first oriented banking here at Dakota Community Bank and Trust. If you're a Beck Fiber customer or the dependent of a Beck Fiber customer, you might qualify for scholarships. Beck awards scholarships to seniors headed to college or to students attending University of Mary. Go to www.beck.co for eligibility guidelines and applications. The experienced professionals at Superior Glass provide residential and commercial glass installation and repair services in central and western North Dakota. Superior Glass is your source for stained glass projects, mirrors, windows, touchless, and automated entry solutions. Stop by and see us at 3323 East Broadway in Bismarck or call us at 701-258-5600. Superior Glass, where you get superior service for less. Bye for now. Did you know the Foundation for Rural Service awards scholarships for rural students? The scholarships range from $2,500 to $7,000. 
Go to www.frs.org for information and applications. Welcome back to Ladies of Another View on Back. We are continuing our conversation with Julie Fedorchik, Public Service Commissioner here in North Dakota. About, I wanted to keep talking about renewable energy because it's not as easy as it, as it seems. Everybody thinks, yeah, renewable energy, but there's a lot of costs and there's a downside, not all of which have been figured out yet, right? Correct, yeah. And I'd like to just say too that you hear a lot about all of the above energy strategy. And, and that is uh, not just a fancy tagline or a, a nice little talking point. It's a, it's a really smart approach to electric generation because each of the fuel sources, including renewable fuels um, or renewable power, has a downside. Renewables is that you can't store it, and so it's only available when it's being produced. Um, and that's a pretty big downside. Uh, the the uh, coal, the emissions are the downside. Uh, natural gas, you can't have it on site. Like coal, you can have on site, which is a huge upside in the winter. Yes. And that's what the problem was in, in these places in Texas and throughout the Midwest where they were relying heavily on natural gas generation, but the pipelines were, there wasn't enough gas to go around and you can't store enough gas on site at a generation facility. So that's a big downside to gas. What about solar power? Because solar a lot of people don't realize North Dakota is a sunshine state. Yes, but and there's a little bit of solar development here, but solar is good because it's available during the peak demand time during the day. And, but it's not available at all at night, like zero. So <laughs> that's, Does, a, that's is there, the downside. Is there solar. any kind of regulation in that where if people wanted to develop solar farms, let's say in North Dakota, is there some sort of regulation that says you can only um, disturb X numbers, number of acres of farmland to do that? There isn't currently. There, um, that would be up to the county. Counties could set up zoning requirements like that and, and establish those kind of standards, but the state doesn't have any um, requirements like that. Okay. It's basically up to the landowner if they want to sign a lease to um, allow that development on their land for as long. We will require them to reclaim it and you know do away with and put away um, the bury and dispose of properly the solar panels, et cetera and reclaim the land so it's viable after the solar facility is no longer functional. Those would be in our requirements, but in terms of the amount of land, there is no limitation, nor so is there for wind. So speaking of re <laughs> reclaiming. Took the words out of my mouth here. Oh, okay. I was gonna say that to go, Jan. <laughs> um, we heard from previous guests that, you know, there's, there's not really much to these wind turbines and that there's a little plywood and a little fiberglass and they're working on recycling them and made it sound as though there's a plan in place. But I, I see more pictures and videos of these big graveyards where they're burying tons of these things that are decommissioned or don't work anymore. What is going on there? Yeah, I would definitely say that's a work in progress. It, that hasn't been figured out yet. Um, in North Dakota, we know that there has been some facilities that have been repowered, so they take off the old blades and maybe the motors and put new ones up that are better and more efficient. And so they have to dispose of those blades. And currently, they're going just into you know the uh, waste facilities. And, um, and we're working with the health department right now, our agency, to find a, a better plan for you know, specifically how those turbines should be, uh, those blades should be disposed of in what kind of facility and you know, how they need to be dealt with on site before they're dragged to this facility and all those kinds of questions and issues we're trying to figure out. Uh, and in addition with the health department, you know, what components might be recyclable, what aren't, you know, all that sort of thing. And then we'll work those into the permit that we ultimately uh, provide to the facility before they construct. But currently, those are those those um, decisions haven't been made, and there isn't a great plan that I'm aware of. There isn't in North Dakota, and I haven't heard of it from other states either on on how best to deal with the um, used blades. And it, that's, that that's surprises a me. That surprises me in a really big way when everybody is concerned about the environment. And renewable energy sounds like it's good for the environment, but in reality, it sounds it could be catastrophic where you have all these big wind turbine 
graveyards and what's that going to do to the environment and where are we going to put it all? I mean, maybe it won't be. Maybe it's going to be simple right. and maybe they'll figure out a way to recycle it. But it's shocking to me that they're thinking about it now. <laughs> like, wouldn't you think about that before you start putting them in everywhere? Well, yeah, I, <laughs> government and industry doesn't always work the way that you would think. <laughs> I, would I would think all their, wouldn't, didn't they have to do environmental studies with wind tur turbines just like they did with the Bakken or any, I mean, to determine if it was going to be friendly to the environment? Before sure, the and there is, yes, there is um, permitting requirements and we look at the environmental impact of the actual facility, the construction of it and the operation of it. Um, but as with any new new industry, I, some, of, some of the things, you know, on anything new mm -hmm. get developed as you go. And that's the case, that's the case with this. And it's, in fairness, I don't think it's different than a lot of other industries too. Did we think about what we were gonna do with cars once they, the, their life cycle was right. over? Did we think of that before we started driving them? Probably not. We're We're past the but it was a different world. It. That yeah. was a different world. It's, yeah. you know, back then, you didn't worry about You could about go back tomorrow. to horses, yeah. after all. Right. Right. Yeah. You, you had know, a backup. Right. Now, every little thing. I mean, there are parts of the country, in California, and I'm not exaggerating, where if you cut down tree branches, you need a permit. Um, yeah. In Oregon, they have people that protest cutting down an old growth tree on your yard. Uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah. so now everybody's so hypersensitive about the environment. So I get what you're saying. Right. And, and a lot of times you can't, um, can't always guess what's gonna right. come up. Right, right. But, but it, most importantly, I think that needs to be part of the conversation now. And, and I also feel like just in terms of the energy mix in general, the people, all three of you, you know, the, the general public, we, uh, everyone needs to be more informed and to be thinking more, um, to discerning more what is driving some of these issues and how we're getting there and, and to thinking, thinking about them in the full picture. So um, each of these fuels, each of these electric generation um, technologies has a pro and a con and they need to be considered in total. And in, as it comes to the renewables, there is a life cycle there, the whole life cycle of them from production to disposal that hasn't been part of the equation. There's a lot of steel that goes into wind uh, facilities. Producing steel takes a lot of energy. That energy also em has emissions associated with it. So it isn't just as simple to say like we're replacing this and, and everything's gonna be all fine and dandy. Same with battery production. You know That takes a ton of rare earth el elements. Those have to be mined. You go into areas that have never been touched in Africa and other places to get those rare earth minerals. What's the environmental impact of that? And, and you know, long term, what are we going to do with the disposal of the batteries? You know, so there's just there's a lot of components to it. It isn't just a simple this is better than that. Let's get rid of you know this one and now we're going to do everything there. They all have their pros and cons and have a place in the market and in the mix. I think for the batteries. That's why Elon Musk is so big on getting into space, because then we're just going to throw them all out there and let them just flow, right? <laughs> <laughs> and every once in a while, something will fall down from above. Oh, it's a meteor. No, it's a battery. Yeah. So, so the general public that's, that's watching and listening and, and trying to decipher all of this, on a daily basis, what does the public do to prepare for these kind of happenings? I mean. Oh my goodness, it's tough for somebody uh, at home to prepare for power outages. I mean, you can, uh, some people do have their own generators that would work for a time, and, and I don't think that's a bad idea in North Dakota uh, because, yeah, we're really dependent on power. It's just like, we lost, uh, my husband and I lost power the other morning, yesterday morning. I was in the closet getting dressed, and and I thought my husband shut the light off. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, I'm still in here. <laughs> and so, so, you know, and then we realized, oh, the power's out. And our kids just were like, what, what? No power? And yeah. Then yeah. I tried to tease them that they couldn't take a hot shower because there was no power. And, you know, we needed the pump to run. And my son was like, no, there's no pump for the water. <laughs> that's, that's gravity. I was like, okay. <laughs> And you know, isn't it something? We're talking first world problems, actually, right. because so many people in the world have never had electricity. And so we're so blessed by that. So but blessed. I have a question. 
as far as like Texas goes or if it was any other state that was going through this. Now we know Portland, that's kind of out of our purview as far as what's going on out there with power. But um, is there anything then that as producers of power in North Dakota that feed that grid, that we have any say so as far as Texas, you need to fix this, this and this, or we can't keep doing this for you. Do we have any kind of a relationship that enables that where we have some say of our power at uh, that point? Well, indirectly, yes, but like, is there a breaker that we can shut off all our power and keep it from going out of state? No. Once right. it gets oh, on darn. the grid, it goes where <laughs> it's needed. So yeah. that's how the, the multi-state regional transmission grids operate, and they're all interconnected. Now, connect, uh, t Texas doesn't have very much connection, so very little of our power, if any, would ever get down there. But um, that's, that's kind of how the, the system works. But why I say indirectly is, like myself, one of my roles is to work with MISO. That's one of our regional trade organ or transmission organizations. And in my role there, like just this morning, I spent two hours on a call with MISO talking about how do they accredit um, generation. And so there's a lot of rules that dictate how these systems work and to the extent that we're engaged in those and helping to set those rules and helping to make them in a way that works well for our state and for our generated generators, mm -hmm. then we have that kind of an influence in, in the so, marketplace. So, Julie, we, we actually, time has gone by so quick. We can talk about energy for another half an hour, I think. Um, <laughs> I think so. What, what would you recommend if somebody wants to learn more, uh, educate themselves? You got 15 seconds. Sure. Uh, there's lots of information on both the MISO and SPP uh, websites. Okay. So much. And I All think right. that's a fascinating place to look. Thank you oh, thank so much you. for coming thank today. So much. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you, and thank you for joining us with Ladies of Another View on Back.